Welcome everybody to this round table of the 65th Commission on the Status of Women. My name is Safira Ramishva and I serve as a representative of the Baha'i International Community to the United Nations in New York City. Um, just in terms of our time together, I'm going to begin by sharing um, a framing of some of the themes. We're going to be reacting and consulting on themes that were submitted to the Commission on the Status of Women in the form of a written statement on the priority theme of the CSW, which is women's full and effective participation and decision-making in public life. And the title of the statement is Leadership for a Culture of Equality in Times of Peril and Peace. And so if you haven't read this statement by the Baha'i International Community, that's okay. I'm going to give you a broad outline and we will watch a short summary video so that you get a sense of what is being conveyed. Um, then we will move after this kind of opening and the, this video, we will move to a round table plenary where there are a few of us who have read the statement, who will be sharing some of their reactions to the themes in the statement, some of their own experiences around leadership and women's leadership particularly, and any analysis of the discourse on women's leadership here at the CSW so far. After that, we will move into breakout groups. We will have facilitators in each of those breakout groups who will encourage all of us to share our own thoughts and experiences on this theme. And it's here that we want to move into a more active engagement to be able to exchange thoughts, ideas, and create an opportunity during the commission to get to know one another. So I'll start with a couple of themes that are highlighted in this statement. And just to set the context a little bit, it's, it's very significant in terms of the moment in time in which we are convening against the backdrop of a world that has been significantly impacted by the global coronavirus pandemic. In addition to women and girls bearing the greatest impact of this health crisis, there's also growing recognition of the indispensable role that women in leadership play. And nations where women have contributed more prominently to leadership in their society have, have generated a, a degree of stability across a variety of short-term indicators, including public health and economic security. And also at the level of the community, women continue to play and often lead those essential roles in caring for the sick, in educating the young, in tending to the needy, and sustaining the social and economic fabric more broadly. So never has it been more clear how much humanity benefits when women's leadership is embraced and promoted at every level of society. So there are three concepts in the statement that I want to highlight. So the first one is, a re-evaluation of the current models of leadership. We want to be building a public life shaped by women and men in a dynamic and equal partnership at every level of society in every facet of life. And so what would it look like for these, these feminine qualities um, to bring in qualities such as compassion or humility or a tendency towards collaboration and inclusion? We've seen that the most effective leaders foster environments where individuals and communities are able to transcend differences in mindset, find the points of consensus in even the most complex and challenging situations, and build upon those patiently and deliberately, upholding at all times the standard of justice. So in these contexts, what do feminine qualities look like? Um, and what would it mean for them to be incorporated into, into models or even to create new models of leadership that draw on these strengths um, at this particular time. The second concept that I want to highlight is the concept of capacity building, of enhancing our ability to champion and apply the principle of gender equality in all circumstances for the betterment of everyone, but that also there is this recognition that men and boys also advance when the capabilities of women are given full expression in communities and societies, we all advance together. So what does that look like to create room um, to build this capacity on the part of women and men and communities to allow this flourishing of women's capabilities? 
And the third concept to highlight is this idea of peril and peace and women's leadership being sustained in all of these contexts. And it's true, and it has been demonstrated in many countries around the world, that in times of crisis, whether it's been a local hardship or a national disaster, women have demonstrated their capacity and their resilience time and again. And yet all too often the powers of society have relegated women back to the confines of the household when peace and calm return. So what would it look like to have women's leadership sustained through both times of peril and peace? So with that, with that summary, we're actually going to turn to a short film that also gives a summary of some of these themes um, that are highlighted in the statement. So we'll turn over to Alyssa to share her screen and share this very short two minute film on the statement. for us to rise as women leaders, taking action to conquer the pandemic and come out strong. So I hope you enjoyed that short film. And with that summary, we will now turn over to our roundtable speakers. We've asked them to share some very short interventions, two to three minutes, um, their thoughts on these themes, on the statement itself, on women's leadership, any of their experiences on these themes, and any analysis of the discussion on women's leadership so far at the CSW. And so I will allow each of our speakers to introduce themselves. And we'll begin with Charlotte, if you're ready and settled to start. Wonderful, we'll turn over to Charlotte Bunch as our first speaker. Thank you so much for joining us, Charlotte. Great, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak to the statement. I wish this were the statement of the Commission on the Status of Women rather than Baha'i submission to the commission, because I think your statement is so much more advanced uh, than the discussion we're having uh, at the commission is in terms of what it means to have leadership for a culture of equality. I, I want to recognize that it's really wonderful that this commission is looking seriously at women's leadership and that the world has recognized in times of peril, both peacekeeping, as you said, and the COVID epidemic, what women bring to the table. But I think there's some deeper dimensions that your paper begins to explore that I want to set forth. Let me just say my experience, and I didn't introduce myself. I've been the director of the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers University for 20 years, and now for the past 10 years as an advisor to them and to other groups. And I have been working on the questions of leadership 
uh, as a feminist uh, for at least 40 years. And I would say that there's a couple of key learnings I've had. One is that in the beginning, we thought as feminists that we had to get rid of leadership because we wanted everyone to be a leader or we thought that leadership was about power. And I think that's one of the most crucial distinctions here is that we still have a model of leadership that we think of as hierarchical and power over people. And the first step to rethinking leadership that is implied in your paper is to think of leadership as helping to give direction and voice to what people are saying and need, which is about collaboration and consensus. And yes, I think women have been more likely to do that. But I want to be certain that we don't reinforce the gendered idea that it's only women who do that or that women only do that because the first round of women leaders had to show they were decisive and could use and show authority, really they had to be like men leaders. You had to be like one of the boys. Um, and if you look at the first round of women leaders that really emerged on the stage, most of them had to perform the models that were given to them, which were dominant and hierarchical models. So I think when we think about what women are bringing to the table, we need to think about changing both the gendered idea of women and men and leadership and finding ways to be able to be decisive and make decisions and help move forward through consensus building, through capacity building of everyone and through, as you say, equality uh, in times of peril. So let me just add a couple of things because I'm very passionate about this subject and have been working on it for a long time. Um, I think that the model that you put forward is really important, but we need to understand that a model of equality also has to be a model that challenges the hierarchical thinking we have about leadership. So it isn't about making women equally dominant over other people to make them leaders. It's about deconnecting leadership skills from hierarchy and recognizing the value of all the different leadership roles that people play. And the fact that every society needs all of its population in all its diversity to be a part of finding solutions and leadership. And that we, we shouldn't value those people in a hierarchical sense, we should value them in the sense of their contribution to society. And if we de-link power and hierarchy to leadership, we begin to see leadership as I think most women have exercised it as consensus and building the capacity of the community. But as soon as we reach normal, as you said in your third point, when the crisis ends and we're trying to go back to normal, the patriarchal model of leadership reemerges. And we still think that's the real governmental model of leadership. So I think we're really talking about completely reversing that model, not to be a matriarchal, but to be an equal model where everyone participates. And I would say one last thing. I loved your point about capacity building. But let me say that I think the main capacity building we need now is for men to understand how they can exercise a more consensus community building model of leadership and how they can be men and be masculine or whatever they think that means by allowing women to have the opportunity to exercise their leadership and accepting that leadership. So we've done a lot of capacity building of women, which is about teaching women how to assert themselves and to take that leadership but one of the barriers we still have is too many men and women who have been trained in thinking leadership is the patriarchal model who still can't accept the new models of leadership that represent that women represent except in a crisis. So to begin to normalize the experience of crises to a new way of thinking, um, I think this is exactly what we should be discussing. And it would mean ultimately 
everyone. And this is equally true if you want to be inclusive of people of different races, people of different uh, backgrounds and experiences, people of different sexualities. All of these things are about the old saying, no, what is this, the saying that people used to have, um, no decisions about me without me? Well, there should be nobody in our society who feels that decisions are made without people who represent their situation uh, present at the table. And I think that's the kind of model you point to. So I'm, I'm really excited and I hope that at least in the future that CSW would take up the principles you've outlined here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. It's such an honor to have you with us at this event today. And thank you so much for your kind words. Um, we'll now turn over to Tashika McBean to share a few comments. Thank you so much, Safira. And um, Charlotte, your comments landed very heavily with me, especially in terms of making those decisions without me and deconnecting de leadership skills from you know, certain gender. So I'm very grateful for your comments. So my name is Tishika McBean. I'm a human rights officer for the US Baha'i Office of Public Affairs. And I work to advocate religious freedom from, for Baha'is um, throughout the world. And also I'm currently thinking about the ways in which um, religion can advance gender equality. So I'm very excited to be here at CSW and to engage in this conversation. So, in terms of my reaction to the statement, my first immediate reaction after I read the statement was a feeling of um, exhalation, like releasing a deep breath because the statement captured so eloquently insights that need to be uplifted into our collective consciousness as Charlotte just outlined. Um, I have five nieces and they age, they range from ages three to 16 and they're all fierce and they're intelligent and they're brave and they're very eager to step into the world and offer their skills and talents. And I'm very excited to see you know, what they will bring to society. But I also know that there's so many barriers that have not been broken and the fullness of their being might not find expression within their lifetime. And this thought is, 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 very, is a very sad thought but it's also gloomier when I think about what we lose as a society if women are not allowed and supported to engage fully in all aspects of society, especially in leadership and decision-making at the highest level. And I think the statement outlined all the benefits that we gain as a group if we encourage this uh, movement towards um, effective women leadership. And second, secondly, um, the statement's message on the role of women in leadership as being indispensable to human progression, I think is a very vital consideration. And I begin to imagine the effects of policies and principles written with this backdrop that the lack of women leadership will inevitably stall human progression in all areas. I often think about what motivates certain principles and policies. And if this thought is at the center of policies, what we, what we will create as a group. So this um, reorientation of our mindset, I think would no doubt accelerate um, achieving growth in women's leadership. And uh, thirdly, uplifting the qualities and skills normally attributed to women, such as collaboration and problem solving, et cetera, I think is also an important shift in culture around in, surrounding the advancement of women. And it is very interesting and very important that the statement um, clarifies that although both me, women and men have the capacity to exhibit all the skills and qualities um, including aggression and, and assertiveness and, and collaboration, social structures allows and encourages women to express certain qualities. And as we know, what we are allowed to practice, we perfect. So it's not that we don't have, we all, we don't have all the capacities to, in, to embrace all these qualifications and these, uh, these, um, these skills, but the skills that are typically attributed to women 
the upliftment of these skills and the importance of these skills in, in, in changing the culture of the current leadership, I think is very important. Um, and in that regard, the statement made me think that advancing gender equality does not always mean advocating the same responsibilities, right, for both women and men, but it could mean valuing the skills and responsibilities that men and women bring as equal and essential to the well being of society as a whole. So, you know, going back to my nieces, thinking about my nieces and the younger generation, and when we engage in conversations, you know, they seem to have no patience or sympathy to wait for significant changes to occur. Like they're ready to just burst through and bring forth everything that they have. And I think that, you know, they're correct in a way because so much potential is lost by failing to advance rapidly in this area, especially in women's leadership. And the cost of maintaining our current system is too much to bear when I think about the scale of the problems of the world that we have to solve, including, including climate change and racism and socioeconomic disparities. And I think also that, you know, and we all know this, we need to create systems whereby human resources, whether it's male or female, is nurtured and enabled to grow and not stifled within preconceived boxes. Um, just because of the body or the race that you happen to enter into this world. And so those are my initial thoughts and I'm very excited to go more deeply into the themes as we discuss the statement in our small groups. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much Tashika for those opening thoughts and so fun to hear about your nieces. Thank you. We'll now turn over to Thando to share a few opening remarks and hopefully um, her electricity is going to hold out for us. Thando, over to you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, so just to start off, and especially since I'm a lawyer, I want to set out a very critical personal rule of thumb for dismantling systems of oppression in general, which is that we have to shift away from using the same oppressive mechanisms that oppressed us in order to liberate us or else we run the risk of superficially changing the face of oppression with no real dismantling ever taking place. In particular, we have to cease the activity of closing ranks, you know, which is a popular patriarchal party trick of appointing people who are not suitably qualified and of uh, you know, no progressive mindset to positions of leadership so as to merely tick the boxes of equality. This would consequently set us up for failure. Remember that not every woman is progressive. And if she fails, the failure would be deemed as a result of her gender. This behavior also only reproduces the patriarchal view that those who are not of a superior kind, quote unquote, uh, are not worthy to hold positions of leadership. There are plenty of women who are perfectly qualified for positions and even more with great potential. And it's our responsibility to find those people or to groom them adequately. Once again, um, because I'm a legal person, I know that there's always exceptions to a rule. So in as much as I've said that, you know, we need to move away from these, uh, you know, patriarchal mechanisms, in response specifically to the statement um, by Big, I've got three exceptions to the above rule that I've just mentioned. And the first is decisiveness. You know, it's my submission that in order for us to truly be successful in the pursuit of dismantling white heteropatriarchy, we have to, at any opportune moment, declare it. We need to effectively call the demon out by its name. And, you know, it doesn't serve anyone to use generic language which seeks to make certain people feel comfortable when white heteropatriarchy itself is designed to create discomfort and is in fact the main social ill that our society is fighting. The second is consistency. I submit that um, once you've taken a stance in deciding on what our demon is, we must be consistent on what has been decided on. 
and this is where I find a problem with uh, CSW and even at the, at the current moment, because historically, the CSW has become a space that has been inconsistent regarding the pronouncements that have been made by the United Nations insofar as the advancement of international human rights is concerned. The CSW, CSW has become a space where we use inconsistent language, vacillating between words like equity and equality, sex and gender. Um, and once it's been decided, or if you know, it's decided that it is indeed white heteropatriarchy that this community wishes to dismantle, then it becomes inadequate to use phrases such as equality of the sexes and gender to describe the overarching goal. If your intention, Vic, is to rid the world of racism, queerphobia, ableism, xenophobia, classism, misogyny, and especially misogynoir, then we have to be consistent in applying the language that speaks to this, and that is equity. And we can never achieve equity if we are selective as to the part of white heteropatriarchy we wish to dismantle, what we feel like dismantling, you know. So to select to dismantle misogyny, for example, but to remain racist and ableist or queerphobic and even misogynistic just doesn't cut it. And finally, the final exception is that if you truly wish to, quote unquote, as you've said in your statement, harmonize different voices and to make any kind of meaningful leadership contribution in a post-colonial and toxically masculine society, we have to be categorically intersectional, unapologetically. Further, if every person from every region of the world comes together and unites under this unified ideal, then we can truly dismantle white heteropatriarchy. And if we don't do so, we will never see the light of day in our pursuits. So no matter what color you are, the shape of your body, your sexual orientation, your creed, your nationality, we have to be resolute about uniting under one ideology. And since these values and principles are neatly captured within the value system of contemporary feminism, this would mean that the leaders we select to hold office must not only be diverse, but they must confidently carry with them the ideals of feminism. And Sandra, we're losing your sound a little bit. We can't hear you at the moment. Can you hear us okay? I wanted to also just really thank yeah. you. Uh, yes, we hear you. Sander? Okay, looks like we've maybe lost lost Sander's sound. Sander's calling in from South Africa and did say that her electricity is a little bit unstable. I think we've lost her, but wanted to thank her for her, her points about intersectionality and um, all of these intersecting forms of um, um, kind of ideology that we also want to develop inclusive language around. So thank you. I'd now like to hand over to Mohammed, um, calling in from Tunisia to share a few words with us. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be part of this conversation. It's really my pleasure to participate. Uh, yeah, what friends have, have said till now is so beautiful. It's so nice. My participation will be really with some sentences, some words, just that. I believe that the, the, the pandemic situation has caused a lot of disasters, it is clear. But also, we, I think that it gave us the opportunity to reshape our mindset, our reflection. And what, is, what, what, what have been said in, in the statement that it gave to, to women the opportunity to be leader because the, 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 it is true that uh, in time of crisis from local hardships, 
to national disasters, women have demonstrated their capacities to lead and great capacity of resilience. I believe that actually the, the human being have been formatted in, in hierarchical manner of thinking and of leadership. So we need to reframe this kind of leadership and to give more opportunities to women. And I am inviting you and I'm, I'm inviting myself to reflect on how, what agreed opportunities we are losing actually by not giving them this opportunity to lead and to build that capacity. It is not a, a problem of women, I believe. It is the problem of humanity. The equality between men and women, it is really a problem of all humanity. And we need to strive together to reconsider this kind of the, the education that we are, we are, we are actually giving to, 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 child, to, to children and so on. We need to, to rethink the new, uh, new paradigm of education, new paradigm also of, like it was said, of uh, hierarchical. We don't need no more hierarchy in, in the society. We need to build on partnership and to, to work together. We, I believe that there is many, many opportunities that we need to, uh, to, to consider. And another concept that, uh, that the statement um, give, give some lights on, I believe, it is the idea of qualities. What, is, what, what are the needed qualities that, that humanity actually uh, need to strive and to, de to develop? And there is many, many very beautiful qualities that uh, as a man, unfortunately, somehow we, we have lost in, in history. And actually, th this, this um, generosity, natural generosity that women are, are um, uh, how to say, it? Uh, that, that women uh, ha have developed in time, we need to generalize this kind of qualities generosity, alterity, um, giving to, to other, um, resilience, like I said in the beginning. I believe th those kind of, of, of qualities, we need to generalize them to all the humanity. And the statement, uh, it was clear in the statement that, that we need to reflect together. There is no uh, already answer to that. But it is an invitation to a conversation, to a reflection that we have to, to do together and to learn from, from, from this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mohammed. This point about reflecting together, I think, is a really important one. Thank you. All right, we'll hand over to Celine to share a few opening thoughts. Hello everyone, I'm Selin from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, I am apologizing beforehand, I'm a little under the weather um, and CSW plus um, cold weather is not a good match apparently. Um, I would like to talk a little more about the um, leadership. For example, every organization needs a leader irrespective of its size and functions. A leaderless organization is like a machine. A country without leadership is anarchy. A society without leadership is a violent and dangerous place to live. But I want to ask you, what is the meaning of leadership? For me, a leader is someone who um, can see how things can be improved and who rallies people to move towards the, that better vision. Now, I want you to imagine, um, portray a leader in your mind. Go for it. Unfortunately, according to recent data, one in five of you had a white male figure in your mind. Leadership is, of course, not gender specific as well as not being race specific. 
we can see the concrete proof of this, um, as Safira has stated uh, before, when we take a look in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic, nations in which women contributed more um, prominently to the leadership of society were seen to have generated a degree of stability across a variety of short-term indicators, including public health and economic security. When women become leaders, they bring skills, different perspectives and structural and cultural differences, which ultimately drive effective solutions to the companies or organizations occupied by men. With different perspectives and a sense of awareness, women can investigate finer details to see what is going on underneath. Women are unfortunately still fighting in the workplace to being treated equally by their colleagues. Women are facing persistent gender stereotypes. Women are being held to a higher standard than their male counterparts. Women are still systematically placed on an uneven playing field. Ambition in men is considered a, a sign of strength but women cannot rely on their ambition being perceived as a positive attribute. It's not only in organization or companies, it's the same in school. I'm a high school student and even I am experiencing those kinds of stereotypes myself. Women often must push through internal and external barriers to find the confidence to express their ideas. I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with mansplaining, right? When faced with systematic gender bias and inequality, women often have difficulty forming an accurate um, self-assessment, a situation also called imposter syndrome, which can interfere with their ability to stand confidently in their accomplishments, talking from experience. Despite the unique challenges female leaders encounter, women continue to push through barriers as they serve their mission and reach their full potential. Yet with women underrepresented in the top ranks of leadership roles in governments, administrations and business and so much more, we all lose. This sober assessment shouldn't discourage us but should motivate us to identify and better understand the challenges female leaders face. I would like to close my speech with the quote of the um, former first lady, Michelle Obama, who, I, who inspires me immensely. The difference between a broken community and a thriving one is the presence of women who are valued. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Celine, for sharing that with us. We'll now turn over to Laura from Kenya. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Safira. My name is Laura. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, and I am a collaborator with the BIC office in Addis Ababa. I follow the discourse on gender and peace and a few instances here and there um, on health, public health, um, since that's my background. I think like many of you who have spoken before, um, so much has resonated with me when it comes to um, the statement. Um, unfortunately for me, everything that I had prepared to say has already been said. Um, so maybe I'll just give a, a very relatable um, example of what it's like in corporate culture. So I think uh, previously corporate culture um, has been shaped by patriarchy and women have been marginalized in the, work, in the workplace. Um, Celine very clearly articulated um, some of these issues um, that come with uh, what women have to face in the workplace. Um, but I think in the recent years, um, there's been a shift in this dynamic and you're finding more and more companies are embracing this idea of cultural diversity and inclusivity of people for people with uh, disabilities and so forth. 
And I think this speaks to the need for a different style of leadership. And I can take it a little bit further and um, give an example of, you know, within this corporate structure, we often have um, companies offering leadership and management um, trainings for their staff. And a huge component of these trainings are, um, you know, have concepts like um, relationship building and compassion and integrity and mutual respect and basically take on a very human centered approach to leadership um, and highlight the benefits of incorporating some of these feminine qualities, I think, in the first paragraph of the uh, of the statement, it talked about how applying some of these feminine qualities um, of mutual respect and compassion and integrity and and um, you know relationship building, and how that benefits um, not just the companies but the societies, um, especially when it comes to problem solving and decision making. Um, I'll just give a very brief example of a session that I or a parallel event that I attended on Tuesday, I believe. Um, it was on implementing the women empowerment principles in fragile and conflict affected countries. And there was this lady, she was a Somali woman who uh, set up a leadership academy in her country. And uh, the idea behind this leadership, company, uh, leadership academy was to um, train women to take up um, office uh, to take up spaces in public office and be public servants and two of her graduates from the leadership academy that she set up um, are actually I think currently the ministry the ministry of education is run by a woman and a different ministry that I don't remember and um, she was very proud when she was giving her presentation and said that um, for the first time in over a decade in her country these are the two ministries that have zero corruption and are the most effective when it comes to implementing some of the government policies. And I think that really ties into what the statement is talking about in terms of incorporating um, women in positions of leadership and the benefits um, that that has on society. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the breakout sessions. I won't say much more because everything I wanted to say, like I said before, had already been mentioned but I look forward to collaborating more with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, also for sharing that example. That's really wonderful. We'll turn over now to Carlos, who's calling in from Venezuela. Hi, everyone. Yes. Uh, do you see me? Do you, do, um, do you hear me? We hear you. OK. Well. Uh, Okay, first of all, I feel a little bit nervous after hearing all those amazing opinions and comments of a strong, powerful human beings that, oh God, it's just, you know, so I admire you all. It's like so amazing, everything that you have said. And I'm, I'm, I'm a, little bit, a little bit nervous about that, but I wanted to speak a little bit about two things that the Baha'i statement talks about. Uh, they increase, it, they increase the participation of women and the leadership of being associated with masculinity. Uh, I think, you know, these two topics are one of the most important issues that we need to talk about. And is that when we say that we need to increase participation of women, I think that the participation of women is of women is already there. There is participation of women. One of the biggest examples of that is the CSW 65. I mean, 23,000 participants, over 700 events, all about women, all about topics on women. So you cannot tell me that there's no participation of women. There is participation of women. The problem is when there is no respect for that participation. When we see, for example, Anna Winter, one of the most biggest icons of fashion, of the fashion world, one of my heroes, personal heroes. When the media and the people talk about her, they say she's a 
co uh, uh, cold haired woman to not say the other thing. Why? Because she has authority, because she's a professional. But if a man like Donald Trump or Bill Gates is a, he has authority and chose the exact saying that Anna Winter shows, he's a visionary. So when it comes with authority, Anna Winter has a participation on the fashion world. She's a fashion icon, but she's noisy when, she's a, when she has the authority. Oh, but if we go to De La Renta or we go to Donald Trump or we go to Bill Gates, oh no, they are powerful leaders. They are, they have authority. They are leaders. And it's the same. And there is a Lady Gaga, other of my heroes, say once in an interview, if I am if I was a man and I sing rock you call me a rock star. But because I'm a woman and I sing pop, you are here judging me. I'm just a rock star. And that's one of the best lines and interviews I have ever seen in my life because he actually said what is going on actually in the world. There is participation of women. Of course, there is participation of women. We have the fierce vice president, female, black Asian vice president of the United States. We are going for the presidency in the for next in the next four years, by the way. We have Anna Winter, who is an icon in the fashion world. We have Lady Gaga, who's an icon on the music industry. We have Mary Streep, who is a goddess on movies. And we and I can like just say a list of amazing women who are actually leaders. Safira is a leader, Celine is a leader, uh, Tashika is a leader, Laura is a, is a leader, Tando is a leader. But why we are not talking about the fact that CSW65 is doing one of the biggest virtual forums that the world has ever seen with more than 700 events all about women's topics and issues. Why we are not talking about that? What is the people not saying? There are, there are powerful women out here doing their best. They, taking that position and participation why are we not talking about that? Why we don't see it on the media? Oh no, but what we see on the media is that Cardi B and Nicki Minaj are fighting. What we see on the media is that the Kardashians are having a new baby. Like, hello. It, like they were trying to victimize women. Women are not victimized. Women are leaders. Women are authority. Women are out there doing what anyone else is doing what is changing the world. And the, uh, the uh, very example of that is CSW65. It's this event. Is that every single woman here has an opinion and she say it, she say her truth. She share her power. Well, we're not talking about that. So we say the leadership often is associated with masculinity. Why? just because people are more um, comfortable with a man being leader, with a man having authority and power. It's just about being comfortable. It's not about that women are no leaders. It's not about that women are no professional. It's just that women, when they have authority, they are noisy. But men, when they have authority, they are visionaries. We have to change that once and for all. We are in 2021, um, in the 21st century, and uh, you know, every time I should see um, um, uh, the media talking that uh, Selena Gomez and Taylor Swift are in a field, I'm like, why if the media doesn't talk about all the good things Taylor Swift and Selena Gomez are doing? Why they are just saying that they are in a field? Why we don't see the media talking about H. Sharon and Bruno Mars fighting? Why we only see women fighting? But, one, but men are supporting each other. Again, people are trying to victimize the women. Women are not victims. Women are doing what they, what nobody else is doing, which is changing the world. And you know, the statement of a high international is actually an example of what women are doing 
can do and can possibly achieve in the near future. So I will just finish saying, I see you, I admire you. You are amazing, you are wonderful and you're changing the world. You're not a victim, you are powerful and I admire you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carlos. Your passion and enthusiasm is always very contagious. Thank you so much. We'll now hand over to Sutha to say a few words. Thank you, Sufira. Greetings, everyone from London in your time zones, morning, afternoon, evening, night. So um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share this platform with such inspirational women, to be honest. And um, just I'll just quickly talk about myself is um, I'm Sudha Srivastava, public policy research ex uh, expert in gender and education based in London. And I'm also president of Young Members Network at Graduate Women International and passionate about advancing gender equality. I will not repeat what is already been said and will meant, but, but would like to mention some of the aspects of the statement here um, we are sharing. So to begin with, I strongly support that women leaders of today are diverse. They are mobilizing the global climate movement, pushing for social protections, addressing the COVID-19 crisis and dismantling what is very important, the systemic racial discrimination. Yet, equality is far off, and progress on women's participation in decision-making is too slow. UN women warn that at the current rate of progress, it will take 130 years to reach gender equality in the highest positions of power. Imagine a more than a century. So this is something concerning, and very important to consider that leadership styles of women leaders in times of COVID crisis, and the response have been described as more collective than individual, more collaborative than competitive, and more coaching than commanding. So women heads are uh, head of state and government only in 21 countries worldwide, as the figures show, but their leadership has been lauded for its greater effectiveness and in managing the crisis. So if we take the example from recent past, especially uh, 12 months of pandemic, women, we, all of us have been showing all the compassion and inclusiveness in all spheres of our life, being students, teacher, mothers, working women, or even grandmothers. So to, not to forget that the traditional gender roles and cultural expectations from women and girls are still a very strong barrier. Women face double burden of work as they carry out paid activities, unpaid care work, including childcare, cooking, cleaning, farming. So, and these are all essential house, uh, essential to run the households and the economies to function better. And all this needs a culture of equality. There we come with the statement, the culture of equality. So how, how we start, to be honest, I feel very strongly that role of men and boys is also crucial in advancing women's participation in public life. Men, like we say, women make half of the population. So as men, so if we need to wrap up the cultural expectations, we need men to contribute this social change. And the change starts from a very early age at home itself, where male members of the family play a significant role. So let me just quickly refer to my own story. I'm fortunate that I did not have to face any gender discrimination at home because my parents, they went extra mile to provide me best education and facilities they could afford. More importantly, I had freedom to choose. So however, I, very interestingly, I would like to mention that many members in social connections with our family used to discourage my father for his efforts for a girl, like I was only a girl. So I, it, it is important to mention. And, he's, and what he, his reaction was, he simply used to ignore and with a smile saying, you know, daughters are blessings. They are blessings of God. 
So this is something I always remember um, at back of my heart, mind that this is how men need to change from the very early stage we get the upbringing. So I had to change this uh, stereotype and prove my parents right that girls can do better with first class degrees, medals, following a rep, um, respectable job at university. So there I decided to do something to support women and join the local affiliate of Graduate Women International. I did mentor and teaching for disadvantaged girls group when, when I was studying and during my university lectureship. And there, there um, I, I found my favorite quote, to be honest, be a rainbow in someone else's cloud. So we need to, um, the, 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 the nitty gritty out of all this, what we come to conclude is that we need to start from home to community, to nation, and then global to achieve all, all what we are trying to um, reach for the women to enable them. So in, in conclusion, I would like to say that I believe that education is the best gift one can give to women and girls to enable them reach to the decision-making roles. And I would like to stress women are better leaders in times of perils and peace we have been seeing for the last 12 months and even before that whether we acknowledge or not. And um, I, because, uh, one of the conversation, I think our first Charlotte mentioned and then some of other mentioned about the role of men and then how, how, how are they leading. So I, it reminds me to quote uh, Helen Lewis. Uh, she suggested that it is not that women leaders are better. It's just that strong men are doing worse. And she added that women leaders aren't the cause of better government they are the symptoms of it. And I, I totally applauded that, wow, that this is what we need in today's uh, circumstances, how the leadership should uh, address the issues of uh, women and girls and also mobilize men, that is more important. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions when the time is right. Thank you, Safira. Thank you so much, Sutta, for those remarks. It's wonderful to have you with us. And so we'll turn to our final speaker with us today, which is Almira calling in from Canada. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to this space. Um, as Safira mentioned, my name is Almira, and I currently work within advocacy and engagement at Girls 20, which is based in uh, Canada, but is an international nonprofit that strives to shift the status quo on young women in leadership. So one of the themes identified in the statement is the need for women's participation in public life and the opportunities for women to be given the full expression to do so. And the statement also asks how women's capacities can be embraced and integrated and suggests that we increase women's uh, presence in roles of leadership and the affairs of society and applying more widely and consistently the qualities that women tend to bring um, uh, like problem solving and decision making. Um, but I wanted to add something that might shift the conversation. Um, I think one way to do uh, the systems change is ensuring that there is space for young women, because young women are going to play a key part in this systems change, especially within capacity building. Um, it's important to ensure that the needs of young women are not left behind. Globally, women make up half the population, yet only 25.2% of parliamentary seats in the world are held by women, with less than 2% held by women under 30. And with a growing demand by young women to take part in decisions that impact their lives comes with the imperative for global leaders in all sectors to open pathways for participation. Which is why, in addition to the statement, one way to increase leadership for young women is to invest in mentorship and coaching. By providing access to women role models, it allows the younger generation to navigate these disturbing power dynamics and assert their right to have a safe seat at the table. Mentorship also allows young women to see what is possible and can be a source of inspiration for those with high aspirations and confidence. And I think a lot of people mentioned this before, but it's not that women are not leaders, it's that spaces of leadership are not welcoming to women and in particular young women. And I want to suggest that through mentorship is, is one way to challenge this. Thank you. Wonderful, Amir. Thank you. Short and sweet and to the point. That's fantastic. 
So really want to say thank you so much to all of our outstanding speakers today. Um, I put the list of names in the chat so that you know who they are and um, can, can look up a little bit more of their, their excellent work. So with these initial um, thoughts in mind, we're now going to move into breakout groups and each breakout group will have a facilitator. And I encourage you to introduce yourself in that breakout group. Um, the discussion in the breakouts will be open. They'll be exploratory. Um, questions and comments will be very welcome. Some of our speakers who you've just heard will be part of these breakouts. So you can continue and build on some of the things that they have already shared. And there'll also be some questions that our facilitators will be kind of taking us through to go more in depth into each of these themes. Um, once the breakout groups are finished, you're welcome to move on to the other things that you've got going on today, or you're also welcome to wander back into the main plenary and continue chatting and just having an opportunity to connect and develop these relationships a little bit more deeply, because we do want you to be able to connect in a meaningful way while we're here together at the CSW. So with that, we will move to some breakout groups and thank you once again to our outstanding speakers and to all of you for joining us today. We'll see you very soon in the breakout.